Hello and welcome to our webinar today on five advanced conversion rate optimization tips that will skyrocket your conversions. Here's a preview of some of what Leelock will be talking about today. First, how to get your website visitors to take action. What is conversion rate optimization and why it matters? How to perform CRO testing like a pro? How to leverage your web analytics to improve conversions? And finally, how to implement personalized experiences on your website? Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest and CRO expert, Leelock Bullock. How are you? Thank you so much, Dan. It's fantastic to be here. I'm truly honored. Um, so thank you for the very warm welcome. My now, pleasure. before we get to the nitty gritty of conversion rate optimization, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my accolades. In short, I'm a digital content specialist and digital marketing expert with over 14 years of experience. I work with enterprises, SMEs, startups, as well as nonprofits, helping them grow and generate an ROI from their online marketing. I've received various accolades over the years, including being one of the top 20 women social media power influencers by Forbes, as well as being named the social influencer of Europe by Oracle. But I don't want to spend too long talking about myself, so let's instead get to the tips and advice that will help you turn your web traffic into sales and conversion. Conversion rate optimization is a process that essentially means increasing the percentage of website visitors that take a desired action, starting with micro conversions, such as viewing a particular piece of content and leading up to all kinds of conversions, like filling out a form from your website or buying an offer. In other words, it's a process that helps you increase the value of your website traffic by enabling your visitors to take the actions you want them to take. It can be something as simple as changing the color of your call to action button or improving your website speed by a second or less. Or it can be a bigger project, like a complete revamping of your website design. To give you an idea of what impact a small change can have on your results, Listen to this scary statistic. A one second delay on your mobile page's speed can mean your conversions will drop by as much as 20%. But I'll get into all of these specifics later on in this webinar. It's important to understand that this is a continuous process, not something that you do once or twice and then forget about. Customers are constantly changing their behavior and their preferences. So it's essential to continue optimizing your website in order to continue growing your conversion rate. As for the whys of things, there's a lot of reasons why you should really care about conversion rate optimization and why you should make it a priority as far as your marketing and sales efforts go. For one thing, it gives you more bang for your buck. The higher your conversion rate after all, the higher your revenue will be. The more people you convert without you having to pay for extra ads, the more leads you have in your list. And the more leads you have in your list, the more of them you'll be able to convert into actual paying customers. Not to mention when you maximize the value of your existing traffic, you can cut down on your online ads and PPC spending. You won't need to invest in more ads, in more promotional channels, just so you can get more traffic and ultimately more leads. Rather, you're making the most out of the traffic you're already driving to your website, whether through paid or organic methods, so that you can generate more leads from it. Essentially, it's a one of the most cost-effective ways to maximize your existing website traffic. If you have a low conversion rate of under 2%, that could be a sign of alarm, a sign that your business is stagnating or even struggling. Ideally, you want to get a conversion rate of at least 4% on your web. And if you're not getting that much, then it's quite possible that you're unable to grow and scale your business. So now I want to ask you this. What is your website and your landing page's current conversion rate? Write it down. And next to it, write down your new conversion rate goal, a goal to be reached by the end of this year. One of the biggest, most well-known examples of conversion rate optimization at its best is Barack Obama's re-election campaign back in 2012. His campaign was so successful, it surpassed everyone else who came before him. He wasn't just the first African-American US president, but he was also the first ever candidate that received one billion in donations. 
out of which a staggering 690 million were raised through online donations. So exactly how did he manage to get these impressive results? Obviously, there was a lot of factors that counted towards his re-election. But when it comes to the donations he raised online, much of it is because of the campaign's conversion rate optimization strategy. As Carl Rush, one of his campaign's major contributors, pointed out. So how did they do it? Quite simply, by running a lot of tests. And I do mean a lot. Their campaign ran over 500 different tests on the Obama donation website, as well as on their different landing pages, which led to some incredible results. For one thing, their online donation conversions increased a staggering 49%. And secondly, their online sign-up conversions increased by as much as 161%. To give you an example of the types of changes the Obama campaign implemented to boost donations, Here's a screenshot of the two versions of their donation form. Now, as you can see here, just by revamping the donation form and essentially making it as quick as possible to donate, they managed to increase online donations and conversions by 5%. Add that up to all the other little and big changes they made throughout the website and landing pages, and that's how the campaign managed to be so successful. So what can you learn from this campaign's conversion optimization strategy and other similar successful endeavors? How can you, too, improve your website's conversion rate time after time? Well, that's what we're here to talk about. So let's get started. So what does the CRO process look like exactly? If there's one thing that defines conversion rate optimization, it's this. Testing, lots and lots of testing. Just like in the previous example with Barack Obama's re-election campaign, the secret to their success was that they were constantly trying out different variations of their landing pages, all designed to help them reach their goals faster. I will be telling you all about CRO testing throughout this webinar, as it's closely interlinked with most CRO strategies. But first, here's what the conversion rate optimization process should look like. As you can see, there are several stages to this process. Discovery, premise, prioritization, testing, and analysis. The first stage is the discovery phase. Before you start optimizing, you need to know who your audience is. You need to learn as much as possible about your audience so that you can then use that knowledge to optimize their browsing experience and therefore grow your conversion rate. You need to establish who exactly forms your website audience and which of these users you want to target and convert. Things like their ages, their occupation, their gender, their location, and other similar data that will help you put together audience personas. Not only that, but you also need to study the particularities of their behavior once on your website. What pages do they visit the most? which pages make them want to abandon your website? What specific paths are they taking? And are they the paths that you want them to take? Focus on collecting as much data as possible at this stage, as the more data you have, the better equipped you will be to make the changes needed in order to improve your conversion. Another essential part of this discovery and research phase is to identify the exact areas of your website that need improvement. It might be a page or a form that isn't converting, or it might even be that you need to develop a better path to help visitors get to the stage where they're converting. The second stage is the premises stage. You know who your target audience is. You know what areas need improving. Now you need to come up with the ideas on how exactly you can start improving. Essentially, it's all about listing all the different premises that you will later try out or test in order to boost your conversion rate. For example, a premise could be something like, if I reduce the number of fields and questions in the lead gen form, I will boost my form conversions by 5%. Can it be done? Well, that's where testing comes in. After you've come up with your premises, it's time to start prioritizing the work you'll be carrying out. At this stage, you should have quite a few things that you want to test 
You can't do them all at once, or it will be impossible to tell which changes actually affected your results. Plus, some of the changes you're proposing to make might happen on the same page on your website, or even the same elements on the page. So take the time to consider which changes are the most important and which changes have the biggest chance of making a real difference to your conversion rate. Obviously, these are the ones you should start with. Next comes the testing and experimenting stage, the name of which is pretty self-explanatory. At this stage, you know exactly what you want to test and why, so you can get started as your priority is set in the previous stage. You'll be leveraging A-B testing and multivariate testing techniques to see which hypotheses turn true and which don't. And last comes the animal stage, the stage in which you evaluate your results and figure out which changes make a positive difference and which don't. This stage will intertwine with the testing stage as you should continue to test variables while measuring the results of your previous tests at the same time. One of the best ways to make sure you achieve your conversion goals by doubling or even tripling your conversion rate is to use Robert, Robert Kiyodami's six principles of persuasion. These principles were first established in the 80s and they continue to be known as the standard for encouraging sales. The first principle, scarcity, is something you've probably noticed your whole life in ads, online and also offline. When you use words like only a few left, limited time offer or final sale, you are giving your visitors that final push needed to make the decision to buy. Consistency, the second principle, is a tiny bit more complex. What it means is, in order to turn your leads into regular customers, it's best to start small by getting them to commit to something small, like downloading a free gift or giving away their email address. Once they're committed in this small way, through consistent marketing, you are increasing the likelihood that they will move on from that small step to make purchases, or even better, become one of your regular customers. Another way of persuading your visitors to buy from you is with reciprocation. The thing is, when you give a visitor a benefit, such as a gift, like an ebook or useful checklist, they're much more likely to return the favor in the future and buy from you. Next, there's social proof. Customer reviews are extremely important to people as evidenced by the existence of so many different customer review platforms like TripAdvisor or Yelp, not to mention some of the biggest e-commerce websites like Amazon and eBay, who heavily rely on customer reviews to make more sales. Make sure to add your own customer reviews and testimonials to your website and particularly to your landing page. Most people are much more likely to trust the reviews of other clients rather than your promises. It's not just customers that can help you make more sales. If you want to boost your authority, you need endorsements from influential people in your niche. When you first think of endorsements, you're probably thinking of stars and famous people. That, however, is not feasible for most businesses. Instead, focus on getting the support of social influencers in your industry, or known specialists and thought leaders. The last principle is liking. The idea behind this principle is pretty straightforward. The more someone likes you, the more likely it is they'll buy from you. While in the bricks and mortar world, it's quite easy to establish a personal connection as you deal with actual people directly. In the online world, it's a bit more difficult. The best way to connect with your visitors on a more human level is to create a well thought out about us page where you show the people behind the business, complete with your story, your goals, your passions, and personal information about you that will help endear your visitors. How exactly do you learn what's needed about your website visitors? How do you gather all the data you need about them and about their browsing and shopping habits so that you can boost your conversion rate? The answer is pretty simple and yet very complex. Analytics. Analytics 
and more analytics. There is so much to learn from your analytics, especially if you leverage various methods and tools, not just the basic Google Analytics report. Essentially, analytics allow you to learn about your visitors and audience, as well as help you understand what their behavior is like, so that you can ultimately change and improve the browsing and user experiences, even without changing any actual content on your website. And how? Heat maps or eye tracking tools are extremely useful tools that basically show you what users look at on your pages, what they click on, what they don't even notice, even though you want them to, and so on. For example, here's what a heat map can look like, courtesy of conversion tool Crazy Egg. This type of technology provides a lot of value from a CRO perspective, as it allows you to see exactly why your pages aren't performing as well as they should and how you can further improve landing pages, product pages, lead generation forms, and calls to action in order to boost your conversion rates for these pages as well. There are several ways to use heat maps, depending on which tools you use for this. Each one has its own set of features, some even allowing you to see details about the actual people visiting your website, such as their company and even some contact details, in case you want to reach out directly if a high qualified high quality lead visits your website. That said, we're here to talk about conversion rate optimization. So here's how you can leverage heat maps to help improve your conversion rate. Determine the effectiveness of your calls to action. Heat maps can tell you if your calls to action are visible enough on your page and whether you need to make some changes to get more people to engage with your call to action button. For example, scroll maps show you how much people tend to scroll on a specific web page. If your call to action is after that mark, you need to move it up so that more of your visitors will see it. An eye tracking heat map can tell you whether your call to action is truly visible. The heat map will also tell you which areas of your page attract the most eyeballs, literally, so that you can move your call to action around in order to improve visibility. Determine whether there are any elements distracting your visitors. Heat maps can also show you whether too many other and unnecessary elements are taking up people's attention and therefore moving it from the elements you want them to notice, such as a call to action button, a link, or even a specific piece of content, such as a product video. Understand how users interact with your content. Content can be a very powerful conversion tool as it helps build trust, keeps people on your website for longer, and in some cases, encourages visitors to take certain action. But how much do your visitors actually care about your content? Which parts interest them? How do they behave on your blog or other pages that include content? And that's where heat maps come in, mouse tracking, scroll maps, and so on show you which parts actually interest your visitors and which don't so that you can then use this knowledge to improve your content as well as the pages where your content resides. Improving website design, heat maps might also help you notice some flaws in your website design. Flaws that are making it difficult to explore your website, that make the user experience unpleasant in any way and unnecessary web page elements that bring nothing to the table. The more you improve this experience for your visitors, the better your results will be. Discover elements that are distracting visitors from taking action. You might think that extra lead generation form you added to your page will boost conversion. But what if instead it's distracting people from your much more important call to action button from the same page? Use heat maps to examine all of these elements from your pages and find out which are helping and which are distracting users from taking the desired action. Improve shopping cart conversions. Similarly, people might get distracted by certain elements from your website when shopping on your website. A really good example of this is the North Face. Notice through heat maps that their online shoppers are getting distracted from their shopping cart by a banner. So instead of clicking on their cart and finishing their shopping, 
A lot of the users clicked on the banner instead, which took them completely out of the check checkout path. What was the solution? Quite simply, changing the location of the checkout button on the page. This led to a 21% increase in click-through rate to the checkout page for the brand. Discover any dead ends. Sometimes it's not users getting distracted that's the problem, but the fact that there's nowhere else to go from a specific web page. For example, let's say someone read a blog post on your blog through to the end. But because there were no other relevant navigational options at the end of that post, they abandoned the website then and there. That could be a big opportunity loss, and the only one in many. Use hate maps to discover which of your pages are so-called dead ends, so that you can add calls to action and other navigational paths and keep people on the website for longer and preferably converting. In order to become a winner at conversion rate optimization, you need to master testing. Testing is at the basis of any successful conversion rate optimization strategy. It's how you find out what works and what doesn't, which changes lead to a higher conversion rate, and which don't have an effect, or even worse, have a negative effect. Although I feel like I should get this out of the way now, even if a change or testing leads to a negative effect, don't worry. That's why it's called testing. Some things will work and some won't. But as long as you clearly know which change led to the, those results, you can also reverse it. It's also worth pointing out this is very much an ongoing process and that in order to keep growing your conversion rate and sales, you should also continue to test new strategies and content. As Amazon's founder and CEO, Jeff Bezos, puts it, if you double the number of experiments you do per year, you're going to double your inventiveness. What's dangerous is not to evolve. My view is there's no bad time to innovate. And while there's no denying that Jeff Bezos knows what he's talking about, Amazon has been constantly changing over the years, from the look and feel of the call to action button to the content displayed for each user who visits. Before you start testing anything, though, you first need to establish exactly what you're going to test and prioritize the most important test to start with. I'll be giving you some recommendations on what to test soon. Before that though, I want to talk about one of the questions that I get asked the most about this topic. How long should you wait until you start measuring the results of your test and applying the knowledge? There's no straightforward answer. However, rather it depends a lot on the volume of traffic you get to your website. If your website gets a lot of traffic, then it's best to measure your results by specific amounts of visitors, such as for every 10,000 visitors. If, on the other hand, your website doesn't get that many visitors, then it's best to do it by time period, preferably at least a couple of weeks or even a month each change to give people enough time to interact with that web page so that you can gather enough data and make a truly informed decision. Now let's get into A-B testing and how to use A-B testing to take your website to new heights. A-B testing, also known as split testing, is a CRO process that involves setting two versions of a web page or landing page, sending an equal amount of traffic to these pages so that you can then monitor the conversions made for each variation of your page. For example, you might want to test a call to action button on one of your landing pages. In this case, you would create two versions of this page where one page has the original design, but the second variation has a different call to action. It can be placement of the CTA button, the color, the wording you use, and so on. That's completely up to you. Once the test is finished, you can measure the conversion for each version of the page and pick a winner based on the results. Once done, you can continue running as many tests as you want or need. For example, you might want to continue testing even more changes to the call to action button. Perhaps the first variation you tried used a different color for the button, and then the next test you can run could be the wording of the CTA. Another option is multivariate testing, but personally, after so many tests done over the years, I found that A-B tests tend to be a better solution as the answer is much clearer. With multivariate tests, 
it can be difficult to pinpoint which exact changes made the difference. But with A-B tests, as it's only one change at a time, it's much easier to identify which elements made a real difference and which don't. Now, before you start testing anything from your website, consider the conversion rate optimization process first. As you might remember from earlier, before you start the experimentation phase, you also need to bring a few hypotheses to the table. What kind of test do you think you should run? Which elements do you believe have the biggest impact on website visitors and should therefore be tested? Once you've made a list, of these tests and results, you can start prioritizing and choosing the best test to start with. At this stage, I would recommend collaborating with other members of your team, as well as from copywriters to web designers. Their input can help you discover new possible tests and variations that you should try, as well as help you prioritize the test you're going to run first. Once you start testing, don't be put off by inconclusive results or variants that produce even worse results than before. It's a natural part of the process, and it's important to understand that it's all about learning, and learning sometimes involves some mistakes. The important thing here is not to avoid mistakes, but rather to learn from them and put that knowledge into practice. You might even run dozens of tests and ultimately discover that it was one change that made the biggest difference. Take a look at this example from Nature M. They used 17 different landing pages and set up an A-B test for each one. In the end, the change that made the biggest difference and increase in conversions from 2% to 19% was the only difference between the tested landing page and the original landing page, contextual calls to action. As for what to test, there are a lot of different elements that can make all the difference. In fact, even the smallest of changes can make the biggest of differences. It's up to you to find out what that change could be. First, there's your page layout. Have a play with it to see how it affects your conversion rate. For example, with the placement of your product or service copy, or with the location of your call to action. Remember when we talked about heat maps and eye tracking software a little earlier on? Here is where that information will come in really handy. Check to see if your visitor's attention is going to the part of your page you want it to. And if not, make changes to the layout of your pages and website. Next, there are the colors you use on your website, which should also be tested. Color can have a huge psychological impact on people without them even realizing it. Test the colors you use, including call to action buttons, backgrounds, and so on. In fact, it's recommended that websites are created in grayscale to avoid being influenced by a color when building a new site. Headlines are usually one of the first things a visitor will read when they visit a page or a website. There are a few different things to check here. The most important one is the wording of your headline. Try out different headlines to see which one attracts the most attention from your visitors. Other things that you can test are the placement of your headline and the font you use, including the size and color. There's also the copy from your page that needs considering too. It might be that you need to add more contextual calls to action, like nature air just before. Or maybe you should change your paragraph and add more bullet points. Perhaps you need to change the wording entirely, remove entire parts if it's too long, add different testimonials on the ones that are currently there, and so on. The visuals you use on your website are also very influential. Images, videos, and other visual content can make a big impact. So try different ones to test their performance and measure their impact. Next, we have the call to action, which again is extremely important and can make a huge difference. There are several things you can test here, including the wording you use, the color and shape of the box, as well as its position on the page. Basically, as I put earlier, Everything from your web pages can be tested. It's just a matter of identifying the most important elements and prioritizing the test you're going to run. Now, I want to give you an example of how important the call to action button is and how it's evolved for the biggest e-commerce website, Amazon. If you look at the Amazon Add to Cart button from the late 90s, you'll notice it's very different from what it looks like today. In fact, Today's Add to Cart button 
would most likely not have worked back in the 90s. And Amazon would not have gotten to the point where they are now if they had used it then. That would be because in the 90s, people were still very new to online shopping and even to the internet in general for that matter. They had no reason to trust online businesses and they didn't really know how online shopping worked. So they needed reassurances. What Amazon did is give them those reassurances within their call to action button. <clears throat> As you can see, they made sure to point out that even if a visitor adds something to the cart, that doesn't mean they're automatically buying it. And in fact, they will be able to remove the item later on, if they so choose. Because yes, there were some of those things they were afraid of in those days, that we would just buy stuff by mistake, just by clicking on the wrong button. Next, they also made sure to tell their visitors that shopping with them is completely safe. Notice how they underlined the word guaranteed and put it in a different color so that their visitors will be assured that shopping with Amazon is safe. Now though, the Add to Cart button is completely different. More people than ever are using online shopping and the Amazon customers know that they can trust the e-commerce giant not to steal from them. Nowadays, customers are not bothered by safety guarantees or anything of the sort, especially not from Amazon. Rather, they just want to buy what they need as soon as possible, so that they can get it delivered as soon as possible. They don't even want to be bothered with entering their credit card information or their delivery details. So Amazon now gives them the chance to buy something they like with one click. Personalization is one of the biggest buzzwords in marketing right now. Websites, e-stores, and even bricks and mortar stores are increasingly leveraging personalization to keep people around for longer, and most importantly, buying more. But how does personalization correlate with conversion rates? Personalization can have incredible effects on the conversion rate, and there are many studies that back it up. One very interesting statistic, for example, shows that businesses that employ personalization on their website actually see an impressive 14% increase in their sales. That's probably 68% of companies say that personalization is a top priority for them. And well, it makes perfect sense. After all, if you're visiting a website but you're not resonating with any of the content you see, then you're quite likely to abandon that website and look for a better solution for your needs. If, on the other hand, you see content that is highly relevant to you, you're more likely to spend a longer time on the website visit multiple pages in one visit and download something, complete a form, or even buy something from that website. In a nutshell, personalization improves the user experience. And at the end of the day, the goal of CRO is to improve user experience so that it can ultimately improve your conversion rate. As for implementing more personalization on your website, there are two main ways to go about it, either manually or automatically, using a specialized tool. But in order to personalize your website effectively, you first need to know all of the different types of people that you're targeting. Otherwise, how can you properly personalize content specifically for them? HubSpot offer a great example of this in action. Their products offer solutions for different departments. And as you can see in the screenshot, they have a marketing hub with various tools for marketers. Then, they have a sales hub for various useful sales tools. And finally, they also offer custom service software. But how exactly does this affect their website content? If you've ever visited the HubSpot blog, you might have noticed that it's not a unified blog. Rather, it's a collection of blogs, each designed to target a different part of their target. As you can see here, they have four different blogs a marketing blog to help them catch all those marketers they want to target, a sales blog to help them target salespeople, and a service blog for those working in customer service. Finally, beyond all of these targeted blogs, they also have a news and trends blog, which is designed to attract a wider audience that hopefully will navigate to other more targeted blogs from their website. as you can see here. When you subscribe to their blog, you can choose what kinds of topics you're interested in. Plus, they also offer you the Slack and Messenger subscription options. 
So that's a different type of CRO method that they're using to boost their subscribers than personalization. Now, how can you too start implementing personalization techniques through your company website? It's not the first time I brought up the importance of defining audience personas, and it probably won't be the last. As I mentioned earlier, in fact, when talking about HubSpot's multiple targeted blogs, the first step in the process of implementing personalization techniques is to establish and define your customer or audience personas. And it's important to understand that these are audience personas of your website, particularly the traffic that you're getting to your website. After all, this is who you want to convert into customers. So who exactly forms your audience? Create several audience personas, as many as you need and as detailed as possible. These are some of the things that you should include in your audience personas. Demographics, who are they? Where are they from? And how old are they? What is their gender? You can even give them a fictional name to help. How do they come to your website? And what do they expect to get out of it? The more you understand their motivation, the better you can improve their customer journey and user experience. And what is their customer behavior like? What do they need to convert? Are they impulsive and ready to buy at first sight? Or maybe they're the opposite, keen to perform lots of research and needing lots of proof before making a buying decision. The more detail you can go into, the better. Because as you go into all this detail, it helps you think of them as real people which in turn allows you to better imagine what their motivations, what their expectations are, and what they're most likely to behave like. You can put yourself in their shoes and try to ascertain what their customer journey is like on your website, what the user experience is really like for them, and what they prefer to see instead. And by putting yourself in their shoes and truly understanding their customer journey, the more you'll be able to personalize their experience on your website. Pop-ups can be annoying, I'm not going to deny that. But as much as people complain about them, they're also very effective at their jobs. But you can actually improve your results from pop-ups simply by personalizing them. Now, several ways to do so. For example, one simple way is to mention the visitor's name right in the pop-up, like in this example from Optimizer. Using someone's first name gets their attention, so they're more likely to read through your pop-up. And the more people read your pop-up, the more likely they will take action. Another way to personalize pop-ups and boost your sales is to show a personalized upselling offer when someone adds something to their car. For example, whenever you go to the GoPro online store and add a product to your car, a pop-up will immediately appear showing the current items in your car along with a selection of related and popular products that you might also like to buy. This is such a simple and yet such an effective strategy for e-commerce stores. All you need to do is further entice your customers with more products they might be interested in. The more relevant to them and the products they already have in their cart, the better. If people are browsing your online store or even added something to their cart, you can give them an extra boost to make their decision to buy for a simple pop-up that creates urgency. For example, something like hurry, there are only two more dresses left, or this offer is only available today, buy now, can give customers that push they need to buy from you. If you have a worldwide audience, then it's worth creating different versions of your website depending on where it's being accessed. When you create this type of dynamic website and someone accesses it from a specific country, they could, for example, see content in their own language but also any exclusive offers to their specific region. For example, if you were to visit Zara.com, you will notice that you get multiple options of websites to visit depending on your location, with all locations that have online shopping clearly marked as such. Depending on which location you choose, you will see different products and offers, local brick and mortar Zara stores, as well as pricing in your current in your country's currency. Another way to go about it is to do it automatically. For example, the Food Network will automatically send you to their UK website if you log in from outside the US, even if you're entering the .com extension in your browser. There are some powerful personalization tools out there, 
and they can help you implement some impressive personalization techniques on your website. For example, a personalization tool like Pure360 will change the content being displayed on your website based on users' past browsing habits and their past purchases, just like Amazon does it. If, for example, they spent a lot of time looking at shoes on your website, then they could see something like this when they visit your website, therefore promoting exactly the type of product that you want them to see first. Plus, you can further improve your conversions and sales by using the Amazon system. Show recommended and related products on each of your product pages to encourage people to buy more. For example, seeing this message might make visitors take a look and see what else they should buy with a the product they're currently browsing. Then these two options give them even more shopping options, as well as providing upselling opportunities to sellers. This type of personalization is a huge part of Amazon's success, together with their frequent personalized emails that focus solely on promoting products that are relevant to you based on your past viewed items and your past purchases. CRO is an essential part of a growing business. Getting traffic is simply not enough. You need to also get that traffic to take action. You need to generate leads consistently, and the best, most scalable way to do this is through conversion rate optimization. You need to use CRO to continue improving your website and boosting your results time and time again. Because as I mentioned earlier, CRO is a continuous process, something that you need to keep doing regularly in order to improve time and time again. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and thanks again to Lelock Bullock. Thank you so much, Dan. It was wonderful to be here. I really appreciate it. Thank you.